a Swiss way of starting uh, on uh, exactly half past. I had a lot of half past, actually. I think we all shot it a minute or two. Anyhow, one thing I want to mention, I will announce it again because I think not everyone will hear it, is that tomorrow there is a party to ce celebrate basically the end of the course and to, you know, you're finally getting rid of me and uh, everyone's very happy about it. So what we're going to do is book a nearby place and there will be just food there, like buffet food, but it's a very good, uh, I think it's some kind of meat barbecue place and I think it's very tasty. I've tried it twice myself. Um, and I think then you can have as much uh, as you like to drink there as well. There will be uh, an area that we're going to try to book tomorrow. I will make an announcement tomorrow as well, tell exactly where it is, but it's actually 10 minutes away from me. It's very close. Um, as far as the topic today is concerned, is uh, I, we have the freedom now to talk about uh, whatever we like in many ways, but I think naturally from yesterday's lecture, um, I, I wanted to talk about Protosynthesis, because it's another example of um, of applying or having to apply even quantum mechanics to explain certain things. So I will, I will say a little bit about it, and I will say what people think is quantum mechanical. But still, it's a very active area, and it's very open in many ways. Uh, there are, almost anything you ask chemists and biologists in that direction, they will actually tell you that they don't know how to how to do these things. Um, the nice thing is that there is a bunch of physicists now going in and using the same uh, methods of spectroscopy that we use in, in optics and quantum optics. So they're really trying to probe biological systems with the same accuracy, whatever this means, that we can achieve, uh, that we can achieve in physics. And I think this is really interesting. I mean, I'll tell you how much they can do. They, of course, they should do even better than that. So photosynthesis, the main issue is, is to explain the efficiency of of transfer of energy from the absorption of a photon uh, to basically conversion of this energy into a center where the whole chemistry cycle is, you know, the ATP cycle, whatever you learned in biology 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And basically this is what produces energy for a cell. So again, we have a very specific thing to explain because the rest of the process is really very much classical. It's chemistry and I think there is no mystery about it. But the, the mysteriously efficient part, so photosynthesis actually has a very low efficiency. If you compute the Carnot um, factor for the whole thing, from absorption of the photon to the output, to the energy that this generates in a cell, I think we're talking about less than a percent efficiency. I actually think it's 10 to minus 4 or 10 to minus 5. So it's not very efficient. But if you look at the first part of from the absorption of the photon to the conversion into, into the chemical reaction center inside the plant, inside this uh, complex, we're talking about a unit efficiency. It really is indistinguishable from identity. It's 99.99, I don't know how many nines. So that's very mysterious to biologists. How can this be such, a, such an effective photocell? Um, the immediate application, so when people sell this, when people say, give me some money to investigate this, the way to spin it is to say that we could solve possibly our energy uh, issues by designing a, a much more effective photocell than we have now. And maybe understanding how plants do it and trying to copy it is something we should be doing. And then the case is that we have to understand quantum mechanics of that. So basically, why, why did it come to quantum mechanics? Why do people think that you cannot do this? It's a very funny mixture of quantum mechanics, but potentially with some kind of classicality and decoherence that's also needed. I will talk a little bit about this aspect. So basically the idea is if, so there is a very complicated molecule. Different plants actually solve this differently. Um, uh, if you have some kind of systems which are very, so the amazing thing is that there are systems that exist um, at the bottom of the sea, something like one kilometer down there, where there is the very few photons arrive there. So that's, that, that's how you can see in a very simple way that this is a super efficient absorption of light because these guys down there have to survive by really being able to catch as many photons as possible and there are very few that get down there, it's very dark. Um, so, so they have all sorts of extra classical features on top of quantum features that, that actually do the job and they're pretty well understood. For example, uh, the molecule that does the job looks, looks very much like a, like a radar or you know, like a satellite dish um, and and it, has, it has a kind of bit sticking out like an antenna uh, in, this, uh, in this shape. 
this is all classical. And, and the idea is basically the dish is, is simply there to catch, um, to increase the flux of, 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 of photons that could be potentially useful. And then the antenna is exactly centered in the focal point of this. This is all classical optics. There's no point in this. Yeah. So basically, all of these guys somehow are focused so that, and, and this is the, the part that now we are going to zoom in and, and, and try to explain. So, so all of these structures and the way that uh, different ones solve the problem is, is amazing in its own right, but most of it is really classical physics and there's nothing mysterious about it. So somehow there's focusing of light, and then if you zoom in, what happens, and it's very good that we talked a lot about macro entanglement because you will understand most of the language that, uh, that, that I'm going to use now. So if you zoom into this part and you say, what does this guy now do? That in its own right, again, is a very complicated molecule. So we are always talking about hundreds of thousands of atoms plus um, in each of these units. Um, and, and I think that's why there was a surprise that, that any quantum coherence could survive this kind of uh, microscopic regime and high temperature. So, so if you think about it, what happens really is that this guy looks something like um, a box. So you can identify seven qubits. There are seven centers. Uh, which matter, and, and, and it's really what matters is the dynamics between them. How do they couple to each other? I will explain the, the physics of that in a minute. But basically, you've got, a, you've got some kind of highly asymmetric, in many ways, arrangement of, um, of, of these qubits, two-level systems. Um, each two-level system on, on its own is a complicated molecule, but it's a little bit like invert navigation that we, that we discussed. What matters is really a certain frequency where you are able to excite an electron from here to there. Again, this is an optical excitation. Obviously, they use the sunlight, visible sunlight, if you like, um, in, in different parts of the spectrum to, to, get this kind of, uh, to get this kind of excitation. So what's going to happen is that, is that simply this electron, you can think of this electron now being displaced as a kind of dipole, classically speaking. And then you've got the usual dipole-dipole coupling between many different, uh, or seven different dipoles in this case. So they would then try to distill it down to the Hamiltonian level, and they can write Hamiltonian pretty accurately, and all the coupling elements are completely understood. That's the beauty of it. So you can really take a chemical paper, and you can get down your Hamiltonian matrix to a, to a huge, to, 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 to the accuracy that a physicist would, would actually like. So they have no problem with that. What they do not understand, and that's what most of these debates are about, is the environment of these guys. So if you ask them, what's the noise there? Then a typical answer would be some kind of vibrational noise. Again, like in solid state physics, these guys tend to move around. So whenever you have a coherent transfer, maybe it's not going to take place accurately because of, the, because of the noise and so on. But they don't actually understand the features of, of the environment. So in solid state physics, Usually we go to, to some kind of quadratic coupling of harmonic oscillators, then you diagonalize that, you get the usual spin boson coupling model for the decoherence and so on. But it seems that these kind of models don't really work in biological systems. So some people are suggesting that maybe we should go to higher than um, quadratic uh, approximations. Some people are saying maybe the whole thing requires some kind of nonlinear coupling between spin and boson and so on. So there are huge, I mean, there are lots of ideas. Some people talk about the invalidity of the master equation itself because you have the Markov approximation and so on. So it's, it's very complicated. It really is genuinely complicated. Anyway, what happens um, when, when, when a photon hits this complex? The complex is, is really, again, we're talking about uh, microns, or maybe hundreds of microns inside. And, and of course, we are talking about, about a photon of something like seven, 800 nanometers. Uh, so, so in a way, you can easily safely assume that all of these seven, uh, seven units see the same photon. So it's a little bit, I think we mentioned it, like a Dickey model, in the sense that the, that the photon is somehow collectively absorbed by all of them at the same time. They all get excited equally like that. And that's a good approximation. So basically, you've got, you've got this photon absorbed. And the key thing now 
so it's absorbed everywhere in these qubits. And, and, and for us, we know what that means. It means that all of them are in the state zero other than one of these, um, one of these units. Um, so it's exactly what we call excitons in, in, in solid state physics. It's the same model. So the initial state to a high, to a high degree of accuracy is a state with a single excitation because you've absorbed a single photon of, the, of this frequency. But, but because the wavelength of light is as large as the, as the complex, or larger than the complex in fact, all of them are equally likely to somehow absorb the photon, and that's the starting state. So in a sense, the, the simple question that I keep raising, is there entanglement in, in, a, in a biological system like that, is, is just almost definitively yes. This is just an entangled state. It's just this. In the same way that a symbol is a starting point of what we did yesterday, and it's just an entangled state. It's not clear whether it needs to be. That's another question. Maybe it's just accidentally an entangled state because nature couldn't solve it otherwise. It's the only available mechanism. So this is a difficult question to answer. We can never probably answer that with, with these methods. So now, um, this is your starting state. And the tricky thing is to explain the speed with which all of these guys so now they're interacting somehow. So, so uh, what I said before is that each of these coupling uh, coefficients, i and j, are just the labels for the i and the j qubit, uh, or exciton, if you like, in this case. And all of these elements are, are known to a high degree of accuracy. So now Hamiltonian, if you like, the Hamiltonian dynamics kicks in together with some kind of environmental noise, which, are, like I said, is very, very poorly understood. We cannot do it at, at the level of the Hamiltonian. We don't really understand how to write this guy down. Anyway, the, the dynamics kicks in, and after a very um, brief period of time, everything ends up in one of these guys, which is actually the guy that acts like a projective measurement. It's a little bit like the similar triplet that I was talking about yesterday, and the rest of the chemistry now uh, now kicks off basically. So, so the question is, how do I get it from a W state of this type? How do I get it very quickly and deterministically without losing the photon into here? And like I said, this happens with unit efficiency more or less. It's a perfect photo detector, and we don't have that. We're happy if we have 30, 40 percent photo detectors in some sense. So how does how how do plants do it? Is, is of course the question, and and. People at the beginning were really trying classical models first. And we know, we know that classical models are, are actually uh, very, this now is linked to another area, a very active area of research in, in quantum computing, which is to do with random walks. And, and, and let, me, let me just give you intuitively what people kind of worry about. You know, you have some, some kind of structure like that. Uh, people talk about these things all the time, basically. Um, um, because they are comparing the quantum speed of, of getting from A to B uh, with the classical speed, which would be some kind of diffusion. Um, and, and so you have a structure like this. So, you know, this is now a, a completely independent field from that. It's just that at some stage, some people, and I think Seth Lloyd and people like that are, 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 are engaged in this research, they actually realize that this is very similar to random walks in many ways. So a random walk would ask you a question, for example, start with the point A, unit probability you are here initially, and ask yourself uh, how quickly do you get to the point B? If, how quickly they mean, at what time is the probability to get there maximum? After what amount of time? And, and of course, ideally you'd like to get there with unit efficiency much in the same way as uh, so Notice that what plants do is, is actually half of this algorithm. Plants kind of start from here, and then they get everything down to B. But usually when we phrase it as algorithms, we, we put some kind of structure like a lattice, because it's easy to analyze it as symmetry and all of that. And, and, and the problem with the classical random walk, and it's exactly the same logic there, is that very quickly you get, you get stuck in the middle. I mean, it, it's clear that intuitively, if you have the same, you know, now you have some probabilities to go left and right at, at every step. And you really toss a coin, if it's heads you go one way, tails you go the other way. Uh, and, and if you allow the, the probability basically to go, to go backwards and forwards, why? Because you've got coupling 
in, in both directions. I mean, this is just a, a Hermitian matrix, so the um, forward direction is the same as the backward direction, uh, the probability for that. Then, of course, classically speaking, if you really could go forward as, 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 as much as backward, this is like a drunken sailor program in a way, uh, you, you are going to see that your probability after some time is just going to build up here. It's going to be unit to be here. And the guy's never going to get to the other side. It's just going to get stuck in the middle, in the most likely state. Like atoms in a, in a room. They're going to be equally going backwards and forwards. And you're never going to pass the middle point. Classically. So it was clear to, to many people for a long time here that you cannot explain this with stochastic uh, calculus. Really. So, so even if you use quantum mechanics, which would be the born, the, the born uh, uh, some kind of born calculation for, um, for the probabilities in the first order perturbation theory, even if you use quantum mechanics to say what the probability is to jump, to jump from A to B, as long as you're really talking only at the probability level and never at the amplitude level, you're, you're never going to solve this problem efficiently. There will be a very small probability for anything to happen here, even if you wait for an infinite amount of time. So, so, so in a sense, that's the analogy between these two. And now you can, you can say, well, OK, so what is it that, um, what is it that you can do, what is it that you can do uh, quantum mechanically that helps? And of course, quantum mechanically, um, the basic idea is really constructive and destructive interference. So what you're really trying to do when you're trying to propagate something from A to B is you're trying to make sure that the backwards parts, which are the ones making it worse for you, you don't want to go backwards to A, are the ones that are really destructively interfering with each other. And the forwards ones are the ones that are getting you uh, down to this point uh, B. And you can show that you know, there is a speed up in a quantum algorithm. In fact, in some structures, people have even found uh, an exponential speed up over, over the classical time and so on. So you can see that this is not very uh, difficult to believe that it's going to be something like that. Um, however, in, 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 real, in real biological systems, you are facing an extra difficulty. And I think that's, that's actually what enters some of these debates. So let, 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 let me summarize what, what we know, and let me summarize then what people argue about. Uh, what we can do here, and this, there is a very advanced group uh, at Berkeley, a guy called Graham Fleming runs this group. And they do all sorts of spectroscopic experiments on, 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 on photosynthetic systems. Now, um, there are two issues on which he's frequently criticized, and rightly so. But I mean, he can just not do better at this stage because it's very complicated. One issue is that uh, he doesn't, so the main, main issue is that he never works with living plants. So the, the, the conclusions he draws uh, are really the conclusions about his experiments. And the experiments use two important things. One is that they cool down the system to 70 Kelvin. Most of you know why 70 Kelvin, because it's easy for us to get to liquid nitrogen temperatures. You can buy a fridge these days. Even I can afford to buy a fridge to, to do an experiment of that time. So it's, 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 it's cheap to get there, and it's easier to see interference at 70 Kelvin than 300 Kelvin. But the trouble is that if he then says, I conclusively show that photosynthesis has entanglement or coherence, the question is where? In your lab? Or do you think that survives at 300 Kelvin? I have no idea. There's a big gap between 70 Kelvin and four times that temperature. So it's not clear whether these conclusions hold uh, in, in real systems. But it's very difficult to do that in real systems. The second issue, and this is also a, a very important difference, is that he, what he does is he hits this complex with laser light. So his experiment is very much an extended interferometer that we keep discussing here. So he hits this with laser light, and he creates a state like that. Then the state evolves. But in very simple terms, the way that the state evolves is that, you know, if you were talking about coherent evolution, there is, of course, the incoherent part, and it's a bit more complicated. But what happens is that there is a phase build-up between, between these different states, OK? So let's call this phi 1 and then whatever, phi 6, okay? So there are phases that are gained due to this evolution. 
And what he, so the, the first laser pulse is like a Hadamard gate. It's a Fourier transform, if you like. He's really doing quantum computation with plants. Okay? So he's got a Fourier transform. He creates out of the states all zeros. He creates a W state. Then he lets the guy evolve. The guy's going to evolve because there is a natural interaction between these guys. That's what the plant does to localize the, the guy here. And then before it's localized, he hits it with another pulse. Why? To rotate it back into the computational basis, and then he measures. And what he effectively estimates, because he's doing a single interference experiment, he, doesn't, he cannot do anything better than that at the moment. He cannot do tomography and measure each of them separately. What he really does is estimate some kind of sum of the, of the, of the phases, of the off-diagonal element. So his measurements are plotting as a function of time some kind of, I'm being very vague actually, it's not quite like that, but it's almost like that. Then he measures the total phase in the same way that you would do it with a single qubit, but now he's doing it with seven qubits. So in a way, he does have enough information to plot the, the entanglement, and I will tell you in a minute why, why this is so. So the fact that he's got coherence between, between these elements is not disputed. I think that's beyond any, any doubt. But what's disputed is that the same conclusion will, will hold in reality, in living systems. So the problem is temperature, like I said, and the fact that he uses lasers. And laser light is a, is a, is a coherent uh, light, unlike sunlight, which is completely incoherent. So, so the question is, and this is where, where the main criticism is, is all the entanglement or all the coherence that you're observing between these seven uh, atoms, is it simply a consequence of you putting in laser light? And if you were to put something like sunlight, it would just be randomized. You're never going to get any, any entanglement. So it's not clear. Uh, again, the fact that classical hopping cannot explain this probably tells you that the plant manages somehow to extract coherence even out of sunlight. So maybe this is not going to be an issue, but it's one of the one of the points that's uh, that's called the debate. Okay, so now, so what? So what, what? What is the problem? What is the problem at this stage? Let me write down the Hamiltonian to explain a little bit more. The Hamiltonian really looks like uh, J I J. So these I Js go from one to seven. It's a very simple Hamiltonian. See, this is far simpler than a solid state model where usually you take the thermodynamical limit. Here we really have only seven, seven um, excitons. And then you've got an exchange interaction between, between these guys, which we called XX, or if you like, plus minus is the, is the better um, notation in this case. So one of these guys, the ith qubit, exciton gets excited, and, and the other one, J gets de excited and vice versa. It's just the usual XX, uh, YY uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, and this, like I said, this description can really be confirmed experimentally to a high degree. So we know this Hamiltonian. There are, there are not many, uh, many, issues, uh, many issues there. All of these transfers are, are very, very well understood. So now the question is if I run this kind of Hamiltonian on an initial state like the W state, Am I really going to show that after a certain period of time, uh, my state really gets from, from an equal superposition? So basically, if you now say e to the minus i h times t you know, divided by h bar, hitting the initial w state, so I'm calling this state, I'm calling this state a w state. Uh, the question is, if I do that, am I going to, after a certain period of time, let's call it like critical time, Am I going to get everything localized in the center number seven? So is everything, in, in a way, is one, the one photon going to get down to the last guy with unit efficiency? And the answer is, of course, not. Okay, and that's part of the excitement as well. So what do I need in addition to that? So, um, and what's the trouble? The trouble, probably the trouble is the easiest one to explain with uh, uh, with, uh, with just two of these guys. Imagine you have two two-level systems. I think lots of, most of you will know about this. Um, so the mechanism there is simply the usual dipole-dipole coupling. So this guy relaxes, 
emits a photon, if you like to describe it fully quantum mechanically, and the photon is absorbed by that guy. And now, this happens simultaneously between all of them, and, and the whole thing gets focused. Um, so, so now let's look at two of them. Let's just look at one transfer. Switch all of the other guys off, and let's talk about the transfer from, from one to two. Okay? And, you know, the trouble comes from the fact that the excitation energies of these seven qubits are never the same. And this is where nature differs from, from nice mathematical models that we use to prove efficiency. So these guys are never going to be on resonance, as we call it. Okay? If they were on resonance, then this guy is going to emit a photon of exactly this frequency, and that photon is exactly going to be absorbed with unique probability by the other dipole. The trouble with not being on resonance is basically that, that, that you have a decreased probability for this guy to transfer energy there. And if this happens already between two of them, now I have to consider inefficiencies between all of these guys. So the question is how do I actually get past, past this problem? How do I ultimately still coherently transfer that if I cannot do this even between two of these guys. Okay? And here is where all sorts of ideas related to what we had yesterday actually uh, is called stochastic resonance coming. Okay? So I will give you I will just give you a very a very intuitive so basically this is exactly the same as trying you can map this because we are talking here only about the subspace zero one and one zero. So I'm only considering this guy in the ground state, this guy excited, or this guy excited, this guy in the ground state. So even though I have two qubits, effectively I'm thinking about one qubit subspace where I'm going between these two guys. So there's this J coupling between, between, between them, okay? That's the, the matrix element J. Okay? So it really is identical to having two levels, call them 0, 1, and 1, 0, having certain gap between these levels and having a certain driving frequency which is not tuned exactly to this. This delta, the detuning is exactly the energy difference between these two levels. And all of them are really very different to each other. I mean, very visible. You can see that the, that the excitation energies are different. So the question is now, is, isn't this a bit of a problem? And we have a situation now actually that's almost the opposite of what's known as Anderson localization. So I want to mention that uh, briefly to you. So, so we, we all know that the probability to get the, uh, the probability to get to the to the uh, to this level is something like the the ratio of the of the squares of, of small omega and big omega. And only when they match each other, I will get I will get a unit efficiency. But otherwise, it's always smaller, and it's exactly smaller by the by the detuning amount uh, in this case. So so the question is so in solid state physics there is a very famous phenomenon that occurs in, in one and two D, which is if you think in one D you're thinking about a conductor. So what's going to be hopping are electrons, not photons. But it's the same it's the same mathematics. And you think about a chain of these guys. And now electrons are hopping uh, between different uh, sites. So in a sense, probably you should just draw it like that. And you should have some current uh, conducted in this direction. Okay? But now, the energy from which this guy is jumping to the energy of the next site is never going to be the same. You have all sorts of defects present there. So this guy is usually going to be different to this guy, different to this guy, and so on. And what the guy called Anderson, the same Anderson I quoted, who said more is different, actually this is his Nobel Prize in physics. What he, what he basically showed is that, is that even the smallest amount of detuning is going to lead to a localization. And localization means you, you, have, a, you have an insulator, you don't have a conductor. So unless you have perfect on resonance everywhere, which you never have in nature, um, uh, then basically what happens in reality is that your wave function just gets stuck in one site and cannot go beyond that site because it's, there is a mismatch of, of transition probabilities of frequencies in this case. Very much 
uh, like that in some sense. That's the intuitive picture that you simply just get stuck in one area and you cannot get past uh, this, this area. So Anderson showed that in 3D, and this is a good use for us because everything really is in, in 3D, so he showed that actually it's okay uh, for real uh, conductors. In 3D is fine because you have many more ways of avoiding obstacles by interference. So if your paths interfere intelligently, you can really avoid defects. But in one and 2D, you don't have enough room to maneuver. In 1D, it's obvious. In 2D, it's less obvious. So Anderson localization is basically simply a phenomenon saying that even if you have a small mismatch between nearest neighbors, you will have less than a unit probability to hop between these two. And if you're calculating the fact that you have to go from this guy to that guy, and you have to go through thousands of sites, you've got probability to the power of 1,000, and that's basically effectively zero. There is no current. That's, that's the simple version of, of that idea. Now, in a way, we have the opposite problem. Uh, we have a very, in, in some sense, we have a similar problem that there is a mismatch. But the mismatch comes from, from the fact that none of these qubits are the same. In a, in a way, it's, it's similar to that. But what we're going to do now on top is add noise to the system. And interestingly enough, and this is a little bit like noise helping entanglement in some of our examples. Interestingly enough, if you make each of these qubits noisy, I'll give you again a rough argument, but you can translate it into slightly more serious mathematics. The noise on each of these qubits is actually going to act in a positive way uh, for you. So, so how, do I, how, do I, how do I visualize that? The logic is that if you think of a noise like spontaneous emission, for example, um, what, what spontaneous emission means, if you take the gamma to be the typical time of spontaneous emission, is that it means there is a broadening of your energy level effectively. So rather than thinking of a two-level system like that, what you are really thinking is an upper state which is broadened uh, by exactly uh, h bar times 1 over gamma, if you like. Uh, and this broadening is simply due to the coupling of your system to, uh, to an environment. In this case, the, uh, the, well, in this case, the electromagnetic field around it. But in a solid state a scenario of that type, it would be some kind of phononic environment. So now, paradoxically, something that wasn't matched in terms of energy before if these guys are broadened, it's really interesting, gives you more possibilities in some sense to hop more deterministically from one of these guys. It's not obvious actually that this is going to be the case. And I think at best, in, in, with seven qubits, we only have numerical evidence that this is how it works and how much you can increase. I don't think this is, this is completely understood what the best probability is. But in some sense, the noise acts in a way to make two things that are not on resonance, to make them on resonance and get them, get them to, um, to couple to, to each other. And I think uh, if I have time, I'll draw one more picture just to try to convince you how this could work. Uh, so there's lots of work done on this, and still we're really trying to understand the whole, the whole thing. But it's a cute example, if it is true what I'm saying, of noise being very helpful in getting you out of local minimum of your wave function being stuck in one place, if you shake the system a little bit, the wave function will be able to go through. And I think that's one of the, one of the explanations of, of this guy. Imagine the block sphere, and imagine that my state 0, 1, because I only need to worry about two states, like I said. Imagine that we're talking about two qubits now only. What I ideally want to go to do is I want to go from the, this qubit excited, I want to go to this state down, which is 1, 0, to that qubit excited. But I'm not driving the system on resonance. If I don't have the noise, what's going to happen is that I'm going to be doing something like that. I'm going to be missing. I'm going to be missing the, you know, so this is your, your Rabi frequency, if you like. And I'm going to be spinning like that. What I really want is a Rabi frequency like that. Because then I can make a full rotation and end up after half the period, if you like, in the ground state deterministically. But I can't do that because they're not on resonance. So now all I'm doing is I'm doing this kind of, this kind of evolution. Now imagine on top of it I have dephasing between these two. So there is something that, and actually dephasing rather than spontaneous emission is a typical solid state type of noise. Your phase is killed rather than your amplitude. That's really something that kills you 
at least thousand times faster in solid state regimes than uh, than amplitude damping. So now imagine, and, and in defacing we understood is like randomizing your face, uh, spinning around around this axis. Okay. So in a way, imagine that you are trying to go down. In some sense, you make this movement, but noise kicks in, and what noise does is just spins you around the axis. Okay. So this is now the circle. Of noise. So if you think of the now I'm doing kind of perturbation theory in a physicist type of way that I don't have to calculate anything, but I still want to convince you that this is the right conclusion. So basically, in a small delta t, like quantum jump approach, in a small delta t I do it coherently, then the noise gets me. Then I do it coherently, I'm still moving down, then the noise gets me. And you can see that I go through some kind of staircase where I'm actually going to end up in this state because the noise is going to steer me in the right direction, even though. I'm always missing the point, okay? But the noise kind of kicks in so that this guy finally spirals there. That's as best as I can explain this. This doesn't exist in any paper because that's that's uh, that's something that we've been thinking about whether you can use some nice geometrical images of this type to understand how this is enhanced. Okay. What what is still mysterious in this in these experiments is. Can the noise really amplify this arbitrarily? So you can say, okay, I buy the fact that without noise it's not going to be as efficient as with noise, but can you really get it to 99.99% um, transfer from all of them to one of them is still an open question. And I think lots of people dispute this kind of logic. There are lots, it's a very lively, uh, lively area to, uh, to work in. Now, one final point I want to make really is that uh, the comment I made to the Berkeley group, and I think by now we all know that, is that this guy, the Hamiltonian on its own, is actually a good witness of the time. And given that what they really measure is the sum of the off-diagonal elements, that's actually this guy here. That really is, what they measure in their experiments is really the susceptibility. Sigma point the equivalent. Um, and I think the latest paper, if you, if you Googled um, the name Fleming, um, or if you check it on the archive, I think, the latest paper will actually look at that, that data from the real experiments, calculate the sum of the off-diagonal elements, and show that this exceeds a certain number, which would be the separable bound, in exactly the same way as we showed. So in a sense, he has, uh, he has experimental evidence about the, how long entanglement can persist in a complex like that. Again, the same comment here applies as, as we had in bird navigation. It's not, the fact that entanglement exists is almost beyond dispute given that I'm creating a maximally entangled state. So it's kind of clear that it should persist for some time. Um, the question is, is it important to have entanglement? Is, it, is this just an accident? And on top of it then the question is, can you do it under, under incoherent light and high temperature and all sorts of things. So I think that's roughly state of the art now. And what people are trying to do now experimentally is moving beyond, beyond this kind of uh, spectroscopy and trying to estimate a little bit better the whole density matrix. You see the density matrix itself is a very simple 7 by 7 matrix. So you only need uh, 7 of these uh, states because you always live in the subspace of one excitation. So if you call this state state 1, state 2, state 7, that's all you need. It looks like 2 to the power of 7 because there are 7 qubits, but actually the system never exists outside of these guys. It's a 7 by 7 matrix. What they can do in experiments is get you the sum of all the off-diagonal elements. But what we'd like in physics to understand it better is we'd like to have each of these guys individual. And I think that would be the next step for, for them to try to find. If they could do that, we could do much more with this kind of stuff. So I think, this, in, in summary, I think there's very little doubt that there is entanglement in this experiment. But whether this persists and whether this is really an important feature of the whole protocol is not clear. The other picture is it's in fact noise that's important. And entanglement is probably not good for you in some sense because it may get you stuck in, in, in a state that you don't want to be stuck in. But then if you have noise that kicks you out of that state, you will be, you will be fine. So let me stop here, and then we'll continue a little bit more with, uh, with some of the macro uh, 
uh, macro uh, ideas uh, from, from physics in the, in the next lecture. It's okay? Yeah. Let's make a 10 minute break. <laughs>
Um, and, and, and anyhow, the, the logic here is that the wavelength, the dominant wavelength of these three photons, because you can calculate according to Wien's law, what is the maximum wavelength given some kind of black body. So this approximates black body pretty well, I would say. The, the wavelength is so large that it's actually larger than the diffraction gradient. Very similar logic to, to what we use so far. So basically, when this guy emits, the wavelength of light is so large that it doesn't tell you where the molecule emitted from. It could have been any of the states equally likely. So that gives you no. So in a way, the diffraction grating is a decoherence free subspace as far as this type of decoherence is concerned. The information leaking out is no information because it doesn't really localize the molecule in any way. So they got lucky. They didn't know any of these facts prior to, prior to the experiments that they were going to do. And, and somehow all of it conspired, if you like, in the right way to, to create this kind of stuff. Now, what are they doing next? And actually, it's not just them. It's many other people who are trying to do these things. So OK, you know, you're not discussing entanglement within this, within this phenomenon. It is an impressive phenomenon, but it's not, it's not no locality that you're testing. Uh, the idea then was, was to say, well, what about really um, taking something that we would consider macroscopic and trying to entangle it with something else that we consider macroscopic? Again, you can do this as a physicist. It's, it's unlikely that this would be happening between macromolecules in biology. So within molecules, yes, but not within different uh, molecules. So the idea there was, why don't we take some kind of a mirror? And I think these are really fantastic experiments. You take you take a mirror, so you can think of this mirror in, in some kind of cavity that's somehow suspended and it can vibrate back and forth a little bit. And you can have another mirror. So we are talking about um, mirrors which, you know, they call them macroscopic. They are probably mesoscopic in some sense, given that they have um, nanograms. So basically they have something like 10 to the power of 14 atoms in there. Uh, so it's not 100 atoms, it's much, uh, much more than that, uh, but it's much less than 10 to 23, which would be what you would call some kind of microscopic uh, limit. Um, and so now the question is, um, is there an intelligent way of uh, coupling the vibrations of, of both of these uh, mirrors? So what's been achieved very recently is in fact uh, having the ions in an ion trap uh, and, and entangling vibrations of one ion with the, with the vibrations of another ion. People can do this very, uh, very uh, easily these days, actually, with, with a high degree of accuracy. But what, uh, what, what we can't do is scale this up very easily. So, you know, there is a huge difference between one atom on each side and, and 10 to 14 atoms on each side. So the question is, can I get this guy to vibrate directly uh, uh, in a, in, in, in in tune, in some sense, but quantum mechanical tune with the other with the other mirror. So what you'd like to do is you'd like the state to be that whenever this guy has n vibrations, so does this guy. Or maybe the opposite is, is a bit more likely. So you'd like some kind of n phonons in one mirror and nothing in the other, and maybe n minus one, one, and so on. So the question is, can we create these kind of large states? Again. These kind of experiments would test all sorts of collapse theories where people predict that if mass is sufficiently big, then gravity would become dominant at some level. And, and you cannot talk about the mirror being in a superposition of here and here, which is what this really means. But you can really only talk about a mirror being definitively in one state. Uh, and so this is what people are trying to do now, saying how do we couple, how do we couple these, these oscillators? First of all, you've got a huge uh, problem. Um, namely, what you want to do is you really want to be in the ground state of the vibrational motion of, of this guy. So you'd like, you, you know, if you think of this guy as some kind of harmonic oscillator, you'd like to really achieve some kind of, I mean, ideally zero temperature, you know, the ground, be fully in the ground state uh, without any phonons to start with. Uh, and then you'd like to deterministically excite the guy. I'll tell you what, what people are proposing. So you'd like to be able to climb and create one phonon, two phonons, somehow deterministically on each side. So that's the first part of the experiment. Can I be in the ground state to start with and can I climb this? And the answer is yes, they can in Vienna. 
they're, they're doing this. They're nature papers where they're doing this kind of stuff. Um, when I was there, and I did some, some, some calculations. They came out very optimistic in the sense that, and I think they still stick to this, in the sense that I think you could show that within that setting, you would be observing some kind of quantum behavior already around 5, five Kelvin. So you know, if you, if you go to liquid helium, I think you're probably fine with this kind of cooling. You don't have to do anything more fancy than, uh, than that. So again, it's, it's relatively high temperature for physics, and, and, and it's, uh, it's certainly very microscopic in, in, in this sense. So how would this work? What would you do there? And the idea is really to insert some kind of laser light into this cavity. So it's all described with harmonic oscillators when you talk about it at the level of hamiltonians. So when you inject laser light inside, this guy is going to exert photon pressure on both of the mirrors. And you're really hoping that this photon, you know, the photon is going to kick this mirror. I mean, this is now very vague and I, I can formalize it a little bit. But basically, the photon kicks this mirror and doesn't kick that mirror. That mirror and vice versa. So you can see that you're going to be achieving some kind of W state between the, uh, the two uh, oscillators and the photonic field in between this. And then the question is how do I confirm that I have these kind of states afterwards and so on. So the, the, they are aiming for something like that, but this is a long-term project. So in the first instance, what they want is one mirror to be fixed and the other mirror to be uh, vibrational. And then the question is, can I at least entangle uh, the, the light field, if you like, that goes in? Can I entangle that with, uh, with a mirror over here? Uh, and what's the trouble there? Well, the trouble there is, is, that, is that you really have to be careful with, uh, first of all, you don't want to have something that has too high an intensity. Because we know that we, when we go in that limit, then the laser output is effectively a classical state. It's a coherent state of high uh, amplitude, and maybe the effects are going to be indistinguishable from classical laser light. So we don't want to be too high there. But we don't want to be too low, because if you think about the extreme low intensity limit of a single photon entering the cavity, which people can prepare, by the way, then the pressure that a single photon is going to exert on a mirror is, is really minute. It's really like trying to uh, have a huge truck going towards you and, and trying to stop the truck by throwing tennis balls at the truck, right? I mean, that's, that's not that easy. I actually would be surprised uh, to how, how few tennis balls it is. Well, of course, but you know, if you're a good tennis player, you can probably whack them at 100, uh, 100 kilometers or 100 meters per second, I think. And I think you may need something like 10,000 of these balls. Well, you need to be able to hit the truck as well, so you need to be able to to aim properly and so on. But basically what we're talking about really is, and you can do a back of an envelope calculation in the sense that uh, let's, let's say we have some kind of uh, photon momentum. K is just 2 pi over lambda and now you can choose which regime you want to be in. Optical regime, lambda, we know what it is, you know, uh, something like uh, 500 nanometers. And, and the momentum um, of uh, the kinetic energy that a single photon can transfer is simply h bar k squared over 2m. m is the mass of the, of the mirror. So this is something like 10 to minus uh, uh, 9 uh, grams, okay? So basically 10 to minus 12 kilograms, if you want to be in the right uh, units to do the, the analysis. And then, and then uh, what, what you'd like to happen is you'd like to happen, what, what you'd really ideally like to happen is that one photon hit, hits this mirror and the mirror jumps from no vibrations to one vibration. So um, with this kind of uh, numbers of atoms and this kind of microscopic structure, you are talking about some kind of um, megahertz frequencies of vibrations of this, of, of this type of mirrors. Okay? So I'd like to make one phonon by hitting the mirror with one photon. And of course you're never going to get that. You will see that you know, the, the, um, the left hand side is 10 to the uh, 20 times smaller than the right hand side, whatever it is. And, and that tells you roughly how many photons you need to have because n here is, is now the number of photons and you ask yourself what, what you need and you really need some kind of uh, 
a relatively high intensity laser pulse to, to achieve this kind of stuff. So this is at a very simple and a very simple level of how this works. And if you write it as a Hamiltonian, I think you can see you can see how the how the whole thing uh, works. So there is a coupling strength between these two uh, between these two, and you can work it out what the coupling strength is. Doesn't doesn't really make any uh, any difference now. And what you have is you have the creation operator for light, and and this is the mirror. So let's say this is uh, E M field, and this is the mirror. And plus uh, some kind of uh, I guess coupling of this type. Uh, some exchange. Well, in fact, really, what, what it really is, if it's a photon pressure, is that is that you've got a number. So that's one possible exchange. But what you really have in this case is the interaction where the number of photons n, this is the number operator, hits the mirror and gives it a momentum kick. And you know that this is described by by the position operator of these guys. This is x. So it's the number of photons kicking it with some strength now uh, here. And this is the Hamiltonian of the photon pressure of this type. But in a sense, it has somewhat similar features of this exchange Hamiltonian if you're analyzing entanglement. Because it tends to really create, so it tends to create entanglement between the number of photons, how many you have, and how much you kicked this mirror here. So, so the logic is exactly the following. Uh, if I write it here, just to show you why entanglement is created in this kind of graph. So basically, again, the state, uh, what you're talking about is some kind of light field with amplitudes like that. Okay, so you have uh, photons going from zero to some, some number n, and, and then you've got the mirror there, uh, which could be, if you're lucky, uh, cooled down to the, to the zero uh, state um, of, of motion, no phonons. And now you apply this kind of Hamiltonian and you say, if I interact light for a certain amount of time, again, it's the same logic always, how, how, uh, what kind of state am I going to get? And you can see that because the, the, the size of the interaction depends on the number of photons, then different numbers of photons are going to kick this mirror by a different amount. And so you're going to create a different number of phonons here. So in a way, uh, the state that, that you get out is some kind of state of this type. Okay? I mean, this n is really related to, to this number here. Uh, you, have to, you have to calculate the, the coupling strength and so on. But basically, if you have enough photons, if this is high enough, you will be able to reach some higher level uh, of the mirror. So this is the, the mirror, this is the here. Uh, of course, the whole analysis, if you want to do it properly, it has to take into account the fact that the states are not really pure to start with. It's a finite temperature. And secondly, while your Hamiltonian interaction uh, is going on here, uh, what happens really is, is that there is an extra noise on top of it. And the two sources of noise here are the vibrations here that this guy starts to heat up as it vibrates. So there's a thermal noise, KT, being introduced as you, as, you, as you continue to, uh, to drive the mirror. And secondly, your cavity is never a perfect cavity, and the photons tend to leak outside. And you can see that the leaking of the photons outside is a very bad thing for this to happen, because it's a little bit like a measurement of the number of photons. So if you know that a photon comes out, it collapses your state in a, in a way that you may not like to have uh, happen too quickly. So this is one of those, one of those ideas how to, how to couple, how to entangle two mirrors. And then the question is, okay, you know, mathematically speaking, I've, I've convinced you that there is entanglement. And like I said, if you do a full master equation treatment of this kind of stuff, you really are getting some very optimistic temperatures out there for the existence of, um, of entanglement. Um, incidentally, um, the, the temperatures below which entanglement exists um, are exactly kT less than the strength J. Okay, and that's where you can calculate it. It's a very simple formula. Put all of these guys together and you will get 5, five Kelvin out of that. So now you can say, that's fine, I can create entanglement. That's a little bit like in Fleming's experiments. You know, I hit this with a photon, everything gets excited in some kind of entangled state. But how do I convince people that this is an entangled state? And of course, 
you know, there are different levels of convincing people, and, and what, would, what would convince certain people is, for example, Bell's inequalities with these parents. And of course, then you're talking about something that's really very, very difficult to do, because what you'd like to do ultimately, I think, is a measurement on the electromagnetic field separately from the mirror here. So somehow you measure two observables here, let's say X and P, and you measure two observables on this X and P here. And then what you can do is put these guys together in a way that, that you can get, uh, you can get a, um, a witness of, of entanglement. And, and basically, just briefly, because it links to something we, we, we said before, you can say X1 minus X, X1 and X2 are the physical positions of the, of, the, of the mirrors. And if you look at the expectation value of the difference squared, a little bit like standard deviation, if you like, in, in the position, and then, and then you compare it to the, to the sum of momenta squared, um, if this guy, if this guy uh, is below certain bound, I'm calling the bound 2 because I'm going to normalize it in a way that this is equal to 1 and this is equal to 1. Obviously, I'm using some kind of dimensionless x and p, you know, so x is a plus a dagger and p is i minus, you know, a minus a dagger. So I want them in the same units. I get rid of all the other, uh, all the other units that exist in the, in the front. And if you write the witness like that, you can actually, if you're below this, you can certainly confirm that you have an entangled state. That's almost